Today we have Dr. Sek Chai, who is the CTO and co-founder of Latent AI joining us in trying to share some of the research they're doing at Latent AI, um, the strategy they have, and some of the interesting research they're doing in lightweight AI as well. He currently leads the interdisciplinary R&D team at Latent AI to cultivate federal and commercial business engagements, and he's also engaged in the strategy and road mapping there. And he's also guiding the products and solutions towards customer success and develops partnerships and collaborations with academia and industry. Prior to joining Latent AI, Dr. Chai was a technical director at SRI International, where he managed and developed a technology portfolio and strategy for low power embedded computer vision and machine learning systems. He served as PI on a large range of projects, including the DARPA's lifelong learning machines, radio frequency machine learning systems, IRPA Raven and DARPA's adaptable sensors. He has numerous publications and issued patents in both theoretical and applied research in advanced computing systems and applications. It's a pleasure to have you here with us Sek, today to kind of share some of the practical constraints of designing these systems and uh, your experiences on the field. Welcome to the matrix. All right, thank you. I love, love the, the welcome. I appreciate all the, the good um, the points you made. Um, I have a, a number of slides I want to kind of walk through, and I'm hoping to give the audience a little bit of a, a kind of what's practical, what's industry looking at, right, rather than just purely an academic kind of a feel. Um, and I'm, I'm going to hope for questions down the line. So I'll walk through a number of things, and I'm, I'm hoping to have some time at the end. Um, and if, if uh, there is Shell or, or Gabriella or someone, uh, just note the time for me. Is if I need to pause or move forward, I'll let me know. Right. So let's let's get started. Right. I'm going to talk a little bit about the, the kind of interesting things that we are working on uh, at Lady AI, and one of them is the what we call dynamic kind of model, dynamic throttleable kind of networks. Uh, you know, in, in in the academic kind of sense, there's different uh ways to call it there's a different terminology i think it's still very kind of new from my perspective so uh this is a, the terminology that we are going after okay um first of all uh, first couple of slides just just on what who we are and and uh introduce a little bit of a latin ai um so that people have in context uh, our origin story and uh, where we're heading right uh as we spun out of sri uh, back in 2018, some of the technology that I worked on uh, came from there. I was working as, as a PI, many different things uh, for DARPA. Part of it was making things efficient, making things running on edge devices, uh, making things run uh, with AI workloads, with the understanding that a lot of the things that are coming down in terms of intelligent systems, intelligent devices would be kind of AI driven, right? Uh, what have we have done since then is kind of Curate a number of folks that can do the work in terms of researchers, folks that are startup veterans into lean AI, and off we are uh, going into the market, right? So there's a little bit of company building, a little bit of uh, technology building and, and product development as well, right? I'm actually based in Princeton, New Jersey, but we have offices also in the Bay Area in California. This is the team. We've started from just two uh, to now about 20 plus uh, folks, right? And, you know, we have Kind of grandiose visions about getting things done well and we still i think driving towards that uh, making things uh sustainable making things repeatable making things efficient right downstream uh, i think uh, team is continuing to grow uh, as as we can kind of go into the next few years right and just the last slide on on latent ai is kind of what do we do we build software products to make things efficient so uh, we understand that this uh People with domain expertise, whether it be in cyber, in, in uh, video, in NLP, and all that, we build tools to make their work easy, right? And a lot of it is saying, you know, what is the uh, workflow, the ML office workflow that has optimization in there that you don't have to worry. We take all the hard work out of it, right? And we built software tooling for them to kind of deploy the system, bring things from production into the end. So that that's the kind of background on who we are and you know why are we here kind of story, right? And what I'll now dive into is uh, one specific thread 
of, of work that we are doing uh, that I think it would be interesting to share with uh, the, the audience here in, in Matrix. And I think that uh, it would probably ask, uh, you would actually come up with more questions, I hope, right, at the end, rather than, you know, this is the final solution. Because I think this is a kind of interesting play in terms of how we can make AI that's going to the edge more efficient, right? And I'm, I'm hoping to spark more discussions and even collaborations down the road. So the general premise is that we know AI is going from, let's say, cloud-driven kind of systems to more edge-driven systems. Some of it is uh, concerns about uh, privacy. Some of it is about latency, things like that, right? Uh, as it comes down to the edge, it needs to be efficient because these devices are battery-powered. They're small. They're swap size, weight, and power kind of constraint, right? And these are the type of kind of challenges, right, for making things tiny, making things running on the edge. A lot of it is trying to drive towards latency, you have limited compute, maybe you have limited memory, power consumptions, maybe even security or privacy. And, and the tools and hardware really focus on these kind of metrics so that, you know, as a designer, you can look into how I can trade off, you know, certain things for better latency, a different type of compute and all that. So tooling and, and capability, this is what the game, right, in terms of these metrics, these metrics that we're going after. The question then uh, posed to us is, yes, given those matrix and given the way we are doing the work, can we squeeze more out of it, right? Uh, and, you know, can we take a look at how we are dealing with uh, doing work within the spatial domain, spectral domain, or even dimensional? Is there things that we can leverage to get even more uh, efficiency out of it? Efficiency can be, you know, better, uh, you know, better compute, lower power, those kind of things. Uh, and, and within that, uh, you know, in the academic field and all, uh, people are looking into it. There's spawns into workload uh, kind of management, there's better hardware, folks are looking into neuromorphic, a lot of different things, right? Uh, but what I'm asking is that can we look into how a, an AI workload, right, the deep models that you're running there, can you actually leverage some of the dynamic aspects, right, in terms of how inferences run such that you can squeeze more uh, efficiency out? And the dynamic aspect, that keyword dynamic, is what I'm, I'm really focused on saying, is there something there that we can learn from and then affect the type of way, the way that you would train a model and also deploy that model? Okay? And a lot of these kind of um, points will, will come through when, when I talk to uh, some of the other slides. So if you look at how people build hardware accelerators today, they tend to be kind of statically defined in terms of the workflow, right? This is an example of a the tensor processing unit uh, from, from Google. They have built this. The main kind of thing that I highlight in color is really the matrix multiplication kind of unit, right? A lot of the ancillary kind of circuitry is about feeding that matrix multiply uh, unit. You want to feed it as, as well as you can, right? As fast as you can with as much uh, a throughput, right, is, is what they're looking for. And if you look at in terms of how a model, uh, you know, deep model, whatever is being processed, they basically process statically, well-defined patterns, layer at a time, and then on and onwards, right? And therefore, you have this matrix multiplication kind of unit. So the data flow and, and uh, the type of parallelism you're looking for is very static and data-driven, right? It's very kind of systematic and is always working the same way uh, all the time. Once you've trained a model, it would, and in generate runtime, it will run the same way. And in fact, right, how do we get more out of it? That's the, the main question. And people look into optimization, such as pruning, quantization. Pruning is like cutting uh, nodes out that you don't need. People look at quantization. People look at, you know, different model that is trained and, and, and organized and architecturally uh, decided. And then you do pruning, a lot of those kind of things. But in the end, it's still very kind of statically driven, right? Meaning once you have the graph and you decide it on the final form of it, you're still going to cast it in the way that you process it uh, in the same kind of flow, right? Whereas if you look into a, a model that is, let's say, how it operates, you know that a lot of the nodes kind of fire at a different rate and a different kind of parts of the node is partially defined. You know, I would say a lot of these neuromorphic kind of notes about, you know, that, that they are sparsity and, and uh, activations are indeed in that form based on an input. How do we then leverage that, right? Because, you know, you don't need to compute everything if you only, if you understand how it's going to be firing 
in the deep model, right? And the idea is that you know, if you compute only the, those nodes that are necessary at runtime, then you save um, in terms of compute, in terms of gaining performance and things like that. So when I say you know, going towards dynamic and adaptive is really saying something that is now today statically defined during training into something that is dynamically adjusting at runtime. You make the decision at runtime, how do you want to be processing that model, right? That you actually don't know and you, you train the model and you structure that runtime such that that decision point, how you want to run is actually determined at, at, uh, at runtime. So if, if you go back and say, okay, you know, if that, that is the, the intent, what, what is the basic kind of components for a kind of dynamic inference? What would you actually need, right? You may have a deep network, right? I, I just show a, a cartoon figure here, you know, layers and, and models and things like that. What you need to add extra is some sort of control network, right? In a very kind of very basic sense, right? And this is the kind of first play in a lot of uh, papers that I've seen our approach as well in terms of saying, you know, that's, that's a mechanism in which you control how you want to have that deep network process uh, in runtime, right? And, you know, one would say also this is analogous to some of the work in, in, in terms of attention mechanisms, right? Where uh, you don't need to process everything, but you look at certain different regions, or you can say different parts of the model uh, needs to be processed such that you get an inference result out, right? Um, so the basic of it is you know, some sort of control mechanisms and then the network train in a way that allows you to then have partial uh, introspection, partial uh, processing of, of the nodes. So what you then look into is can the uh, control network be context dependent because you're pulling an input. It's not always statically defined, but it would change over time. The context in terms of the environment changes. So if the scene becomes darker, do you want to process your deep network uh, differently? If it's sunlight, would you want to process it differently? You can have different inputs to say, well, maybe your battery power is lower. So that's your input and say, well, based on lower battery power, maybe I need to run my deep network differently, right? Uh, and that selection is done at runtime. So with that kind of context dependent and the kind of selection done at runtime, you have the basic mechanisms of having a dynamic inference. Then the question is, how, how does that relate back to hardware? If, if you want to then process this thing dynamically, what does it really mean, right? Uh, and, and I've kind of given a, a, at least a first take on it, which is say, if you have a, a model and you have slices up in a way that you're running it dynamically, from a fine grain perspective, you can run pieces of that model as you need. So you start to carve out the model so that you don't have to process everything all at once, but you can have pieces that, uh, that you want to run and you decide which one you want to run dynamically, right? You can have kind of coarse grain uh, kind of mechanisms as well. We say, okay, maybe partial parts of the model carve out maybe into two that allows you to then run a, a split version of that model, parts of it on most of the time, and then the rest uh, on for, for kind of conditions that you need. A lot of the wake up systems can be uh, situated that way. Wake up meaning, you know, a smaller low power device or lower power circuitry that is always on, but you're really running pieces of that uh, model. And then when, when occasion comes up, when you need it, then you wake up the rest of the unit uh, maybe a different host to say, okay, process a, a, the larger component of that model, right? Uh, some examples in industry that people are thinking about is like a, a video doorbell, right? The video doorbell, you know, when someone pressed the button, uh, then you say, is there a person there? If there's a person, maybe then I need to do more workload, right? Identify whether it is a delivery person, if it's somebody you know, uh, those kind of things to open a door, for example, right? As opposed to you know having the model run all the time to distinguish all of that all at once, which requires you to have a a higher kind of uh, processing capability to do a, a larger model, right? So my my anticipation is that yes, dynamic processing can be done today. There will be more efficiency gains in the near future as folks anticipate how to build hardware specific to that type of uh, workload. That in fact you're not processing the the model uh, all at once, but pieces of it can run. Uh, my, my also kind of uh, expectations and my understanding of, of how folks can build very well dynamic hardware um, uh, lends itself to that. So if you look at processor designs and things, people do things very well with um, 
know, cache prediction, uh, uh, load, uh, load preloading kind of memory things. All those are all dynamic mechanisms that are in circuitry today. We know how to do that well. But in fact, the, the deep models that we built today are not structured that way. So they don't necessarily use those kind of mechanisms for the type of workloads that, that are presented to them. So now back to the modeling side, right? Um, what are some examples? How, how are things different, right? And I just put up a couple of example papers that I thought is semi-representative of what I meant by dynamic. There is a, a paper here uh, called GatorNet, where you have this uh, you know, backbone model and then a, a controlling mechanism. There's another paper called Slimmable Neural Network, where you have different slices and you only turn on slices as you go. So you train these networks so that it's resilient, have parts turned off. And there's another paper that uh, we just recently published on the journal where you have that same notion of controller network and a, a backbone network, but there's actually more uh, flexibility in terms of how you control pieces of it. And even the controller is trained separately. And I'll, I'll go through that uh, particular example, right? The key differentiation here in terms of what I mean by static and dynamic is that the amount of processing is really determined at runtime, right? The applications have the choice of how hard you want to work. You give the, the context um, into the system and then it decides how it wants to run. So therefore, you, you can have some potential of squeezing more performance efficiency based on how things are, are deployed, right? All right. So then going going through that example, and I thought it's, it's more interesting to kind of show a use case. I'm going to end up with some videos, some examples that I think will kind of highlight all of these kind of things together, right? how it can be deployed. But I want to go through an example of how we would actually potentially, let's say, train the neural network, right? how do you organize and train it such that, you know, you arrive at a uh, dynamic system, right? So when, when we say throttleable neural network, the term throttleable means that you know there's a way to turn it up and down as needed therefore you need to train the model such that it can anticipate that so the the backbone uh, deep network uh, we, we can train it uh, width wise depth wise and dependent nested meaning parts of it can turn on or off so you need to be resilient to have uh, almost like a, a dropout kind of a notion Right. In this case, it's a runtime dropout. You know, you, you do drop out from, from a training perspective because you want to diversify all your features and, and understand you know, how to converge and generalize. But be also training it from a runtime dropout perspective in the sense that um, you want to make sure that if pieces of the model are not turned on, are not being processed, you're still getting that, that performance. Right. And I'll give some intuition and some highlights about what, what it means to train in that, in that form. But you can actually formulate in terms of um, how you want to slice it up, you know, depth-wise, uh, width-wise, and all that kind of things. On the controller side, uh, we, we kind of went all the way to using a reinforcement uh, learning kind of approach to train uh, almost like a state machine, if you will. You may have different states, different things you want to turn on. You know, if you think about your deep uh, network, Right, your backbone having eight different states, eight different ways you can turn on and off. That, those are the kind of states that you want to represent. Right? How many of them should you turn on to get the best result you have? And we can use a almost like a game kind of mechanisms where you give it reward as you train the controller. Um, you know the better um, set of uh, uh, points to turn on allows you to get the better uh, performance at the end. So we can train it that way, right? And what we do here is we decouple the training between the controller and the deep network. We don't train it, we train it separately. And we find that this, this helps in training convergence and you have a, almost like a separation of concerns in that sense. Okay, so on, on the controller side, I, I talked about it, right? Where you can actually go very simple. You can have a heuristic as a, and you codify that way. We are talking more on the RL side in terms of how we can explore it, but you can actually use either one of these, right? Uh, the end game is that this controller state machine kind of things is driving one signal into the, the deep network, right? And we call this a utilization. You know, how, how hard do you want to utilize it? So it's a few con uh, control gates to say which one I want to turn on. And there's a reward mechanism to say, you know, having these things turned on, uh, 
in this kind of pattern for that uh, result gives you the best result, right? So the controller ha has a range of things that you can build from very simple things to more data-driven kind of approaches. And I'll show you an example with, with the, the workload there. Gabrielle, you have a question? Yes, I do. So um, you are saying that now the controller has a simple uh, way of operation, but are you envisioning uh, switching uh, later on in a in a controller that will learn as well? Yes, yes. So in th in this example, I'll show you with the gesture recognition thing. You actually um, are learning in terms of um, what states you need to turn on, right? Mm -hmm. For what different scenarios, right? I'll, I'll, we'll go into that example. What I'm suggesting is that um, uh, in some cases, you can also just codify right, very heuristic, very simple kind of things. And you can start from there to more data-driven things, right? Got it. Using okay. ML, right? Okay. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to give you almost like a taxonomy, like, okay, you know, how would you design something like this? And then in, in the next and few slides, show, show how it could be done. Got so, it, thank you. Um, so before getting to kind of video examples and you know an and application kind of thing, let's let's look into some basic intuition. What's really happening in in, in the model, right? The backbone as, as we have trained it. So control out of the way, but just the backbone as you train it, and you now you're, you're turning things off, right? So you have a model that's nice and pristine, and you know you you say, oh, this is this is great, uh, and it's doing you know what you need to do in terms of accuracy as a whole. Then you go in and say, I'm going to turn parts of it off. What happens, right? So naively training it, you get this naive training thing, which is say amount of gating, how much of the, the model you're actually turning off, the accuracy starts to drop off. So if you just train it the way you do today, um, without any kind of understanding of that, things will be turned off downstream, the accuracy would just taper off. What, what it means is then you, you're not are going to anticipate the, the the features that you need to recognize an object, the features that you need to do whatever task you want. You're simply saying, well, if it's turned off, I'm going to start dropping accuracy. That's nothing I can do because I was dependent on those features, right? So if you have a model, the network and things, and you start turning things off, you start seeing a leveling of, of accuracy, you start to drop off really quickly. Again, it's understood. You know, features that you need to recognize an object to, to do the task, it's not there anymore because you never process it, right? When you start training it with the anticipation that, um, you know, parts of them are turned off. So as you train, you have these kind of dropout scenarios. You say, I'm going to start turning things on and on, off. What's happening is then you start to choose features that are not kind of centralized, meaning um, it's never dependent on one single feature. So if you have one, one feature that absolutely needs to be on all the time and, and it's no longer, it's gated out, it's turned off, then your performance really go low. So what you do, what, what ends up train, when you train with kind of runtime dropout, as I described it, you start to select features that are uh, not dependent, right? Independent of each other, that it could persist and the information is now more spread out, sparsifying, um, and disentangle some of this representation across the model. So if any parts of the model are turned off for whatever reason, you can still run it through. And you can maintain that accuracy up to a certain point where you say, you know, it's not gonna do anymore because you know you, you're not enough capacity, let's say, to uh, resolve the task. So it has a propensity of saying, you know, I'm going to uh, um, you know, be, be robust to have the, with the amount of gating, but still maintain the accuracy up to a certain point. So that's why we have observed it. And I think that's a kind of really interesting intuition about how we're training and how we are addressing uh, kind of runtime dropout as I have defined it, right? The, the other interesting point, and, and people kind of uh, uh, pay attention to this, right? If you look at zero gating, so if you don't turn off anything at all, right? The naive training is actually higher than the the, 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 the lane AI target one, target two kind of scenario where, where you, you are doing gating, right? So in this example, what's happening is that there is a, a set of features that is always very important and you have to have it on, but you actually give you better performance, right? But if you're trading off then the ability to, to throttle, um, so you, you're at zero gating, right? You're dropping some accuracy, 
when it's zero, but you, you are trading off the ability to kind of gate more, right? So there might be a solution that you need to have things on all the time, but uh, the way we're training it, that's not an, a, a solution for us when, we, when we're doing throttling, okay? Just a quick question on that. So does that mm -hmm. mean that your environments are much more dynamic in a way? Because otherwise, you would stay on the zero, right? Yes, yes, exactly. So what we're saying is, of, of the many choices you have when you train, uh, that is not a good choice for throttling case. Yeah. Right? Because there is a set of features that need to be on. Now, if, if you identify that and say, these, these are carved out, sure. But if you're just saying homogeneously, I want to have any number of these points, these parts of the model turned off. Uh, the 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 best solution in terms of accuracy may not be the one that is good for throttling. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. And and that was interesting. It it just kind of tells you 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 have now a, a new set of dimension, right? In terms of your your um, your uh, search space. So people when when they are training for for. Uh, you know, a network, you're training it, you're really doing a search, right? You're doing a search about what is the best set of features and set of weights that helps me resolve the task, get the best accuracy. Now there's an extra dimension that says, well, um, how hard do you want to push the envelope in terms of having parts of the model turned off for the sake of having you know, less computation, for the sake of having more tolerance and, and more dynamic kind of behaviors when you deploy the model? Okay. Uh, we, we've done some early results in terms of measurements, uh, power, and things like that. And, you know, different hardware would give you kind of different profiles and, and all that. But what, what we've observed, I thought was interesting that we can we would like to share is if you look at runtime and, and power as, as we have measured it, right? What you see is almost like a linear kind of drop as you start to uh, gate the model. So if you say, I'm going to turn off more and more of the, the model, of course, it would start to ramp down in terms of, you know, um, you know, the power you consume and the time it needs to compute it, right? Um, but what you see in terms of the accuracy is that even though you're turning things off and you're getting kind of faster kind of reach, uh, inference time, the accuracy is kind of still staying up to a certain point when it drops off. So that's, that's really the, the kind of benefit at the end of it, right? That you're gaining some speed, the accuracy still still kind of maintained. Uh, so you, you you do want this kind of profile where linearly in, in a way the runtime and power are kind of dropping as as you have a different kind of uh, operating point, but the accuracy kind of maintains over time. Darisha, you have a question. Right. Maybe you're going to cover this later. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, one of the things when you're doing this kind of um, uh, runtime redistribution is, I think. For in, in the case of your examples, also in the previous slide, there could be certain classes that could be more impacted than others if they're on the outlier cases, right? Yes. Uh, have you considered that? Yes, yes. Uh, have we considered? We know that there, there are going to be those kind of situation. Uh, we haven't done experimentation where you prioritize uh, your your um, your design, your model, and how you would train it. Um, we we thought about you know what we show here is is a one big monolithic model right and that one big monolithic model have all these classes into it and then you decide what you want to do um, you can actually uh, construct your model as you as you build it up in a different manner for example you say okay this uh, set of initial model I've, I've trained on the high priority classes. So if you're looking for people, cars, maybe those are the ones, right? And, and you train that. Then in an ensemble kind of mode, build up kind of components next to it. So now you can you 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 know you have trained certain corpus that is important priority-wise, and then you have other ensembles that built on, right? Dogs and cats and Siamese cats, some of them not as important as they say you want to detect people or cars, let's say. Then you can afford the throttling. So it is a is a architectural definition in terms of how you want to compose that model. What I'm showing here is okay, if, if it's all monolithic, these are the type of things that you you are dealing with in terms of trading off uh what we mean by gating, what we mean by throttling at the end. Does that make sense? Yeah, thank you. So that actually opens up a good point where um 
you know, by construction, you can think about how else you want to organize your model with the intent that you can have a dynamic kind of response when you deploy these models, right? Now, now comes the kind of interesting part uh, where, uh, let's, let's look at an example. You know, we talk about these, you know, slide plots and, and graphs, and it looks very interesting, but why? I like to see some, some examples. I like to see how is it may be working, right? Uh, and what I had is um, uh, uh, an example here for, for gesture recognition. I got some interns that, that work with me uh, to construct all these things out to kind of prove what it could be, could be done, right? Uh, and, and we kind of put a lot of these uh, thoughts about how do we want to best show off uh, what it means by by throwing and things like that. So in this this example here, we've constructed a an ML system where uh, you're doing inference on your gesture. You're moving your know, hand left and right and things like that. Uh, you're looking for hand hand pose. Uh, we do some visualizations things on top. So you say, okay, these are the hands that are being uh, recognized. But there's a data network that says, you know, am I going to classify that gesture? Right, that sequence of um, input frames, uh, is it a, a this left, right, swipe, up and down, those kind of classification of the gesture. That's the, the data network that we are throttling over, right? And then we have a, a what we call it, uh, RL train context aware controller that controls it, much like how I described in the, uh, in the previous kind of slide, right? And then we kind of drew some GUI in, in understanding of what is that utilization, right? Uh, are we turning it on more often or less, right, based on the different gestures. And then kind of say, you know, can we now visually see what's happening in the model and how you're doing some sort of dynamic kind of mechanisms to it, right? So this is the construct in which the, the next set of videos I will show. So what you see here, and this is on YouTube, by the way, where, um, you know, VD is, is doing a left, right, up, down, different type of gestures that we have trained the, the model, right, to do. But what you see on, on the throttle meter, it is, is not always pegged at 100%. It's not always turning on everything. But it's going to toggle between, you know, 20 30% and up as it needs, right? And intuitively, what, what it's saying is that I'm not working as hard uh, when, when I don't need to. And I work harder when I need to have actually more confidence. Um, I will show you in a couple of slides later where, you know, intuitively, what it's saying is if you're doing a left-right swipe, and you have enough frames to recognize uh, that it is good enough to know that it is a left right swipe. Then you, you stop doing harder work and you travel back down, right? And you have the propensity to switch when you need it to. The context aware controller then have that decision point, right? Where I'm, the whole point of that controller is to make sure you try to go for the best accuracy. You've trained it that way. And it's about then turning on the right switches, right? And, and, and gate the right set of uh, units within the um, the deep network to get you to the best performance, right? So it's not always pegged to the, to the right in terms of the utility, but it's going to swap in and out as needed, right? For this case, and and this one is actually an interesting. Um, kind of view into it, right? Where if you look at each of these graphs, right? They represent uh, different gestures, different gestures that uh, that we train it to. Right? It goes from, you know, shaking hand, thumbs and uh, thumbs up, thumbs down, left, right, all those kind of things. But you see different profiles. Each of these graphs represents how, how hard the utilization uh, that control network needs to decide, right? Uh, but what it says is this is the best uh, you will want to turn on, but there's actually different profiles in which you use the network. It's trained in a way to recognize all of these, but the best way to turn any one of this can be different for different gestures, meaning that there's different ways to get the best result, but that doesn't need to have everything turned on to compute that result. Right? And the whole game then comes that control network making a decision at runtime to turn any of these signature profiles uh, that uh, is best for that uh, condition. Uh, we've kind of gone since then to do a more interesting uh, different type of um, scenarios beyond the gesture around starting to put the cameras outside. In this case here, we, we've taken that, that notion of a throttling network into kind of video surveillance. 
um, and showing you know things running on a Raspberry Pi uh, where you know the standard way everything is running you you're running pretty hard uh, but uh, with the throttling kind of sense you can go up and down right and still get similar kind of performance in terms of uh, you know gaining as you need it. And, and I'm going to end with a couple of slides and then we have time for, for questions and answers. But what, what becomes interesting, I start off the, the, the presentation with a set of metrics that I talked about. Right? With a set of metrics, the metrics is like, you know, latency, power, uh, memory, those kind of things. But with, um, with dynamic networks, you have to start rethinking what, what is the goal here? What, what are you measuring? What are things that now become important, right? And I'm, I'm suggesting to the audience that you have a whole new of metrics that you're now looking for with dynamic networks, because it's no longer just a static kind of defined workload. Uh, it's things that are changing. So you may have things like, you know, what is the working memory footprint that, that changes over time? Maybe you have different things running on your processor. You can only afford so much uh, memory in terms of working footprint. Uh, what is the working memory footprint? You may have a model that is heavy and you have a lot of things that you need to load into to memory to load. But with dynamic networks, you say, what is the working memory footprint at a certain condition? So now that becomes an interesting metric where it's more about how it changes over time. Same thing with, with accuracy, right? Um, when you look at an image frame and you're trying to detect objects and things today, you say, what, what is the accuracy? Statistically, what is the accuracy over a number of um, you know, object classes that you show it to and you come up with a, a score, right? Accuracy score, map score, those kind of things. But with dynamic kind of networks, you start to think maybe it's sustained accuracy. How, how well you can keep that accuracy or, you know, how, how long do you maintain um, a good confidence on, on a particular, uh, you know, object and things. It's sustained uh, kind of accuracy. Um, another interesting kind of metric might be recovery time. Because you anticipate the, the network to be changing over time it is not that it needs to get 100% kind of performance all the time. It's really how fast you go up to that 100%. So you may have a quiet sleep mode and things like that, but you recover quickly. You go up and you're performing well, and then you go back to in the low power mode. So the recovery time becomes an interesting metric, right? And I, I give this kind of example to, to a lot of folks that didn't understand what that, that really meant. When, when you're driving, for example, as a, as a kind of example, when you're driving and something comes in front of you, the first thing you do is you, you swerve, right? You recover and you swerve, and then you say, well, what, what did I just miss? Um, so there's a level of understanding of what do you want to achieve and what kind of uh, recovery in terms of actually recognizing the object, different phases of it, maybe different parts of that model as you have trained it, can, this needs to turn on when it needs to. So those type of metrics become interesting, it becomes more system oriented kind of things rather than just the model. And the, the kind of energy is still, is still there, but now it's per task as you have find it, right? And it's changing that energy profile over time, right? So what, what I'm suggesting is these are not just the, the kind of end goal metrics or whatever, I'm asking the audience to think about what other metrics that you can go after in terms of getting that better squeezing more efficiency out of what, what you're deploying, right? That the metrics and benchmarks and stuff can change, and we ought to change that when you have kind of new approaches to do what you need to do. Um, I have a kind of long set of video here. I'll just play it and it'll walk through, um, uh, you know, what, what it means. Try to organize, you know, some thoughts about uh, where, where is this heading, right? And, and this kind of accumulates a lot of the things that I presented, but, you know, in, in a single form. Uh, in this case here, same thing where um, there's a person detector model that runs, uh, it is always on. Uh, but when a person comes in the scene, you start to detect something else, right? What, what are the objects that are around there? But if the person's not in the scene, you know, you're in low power mode, right? So the person detector is always on, but you only run heavy when, when something uh, comes in the scene. That affords you that, that dynamic kind of mechanisms and kind of give you a little bit more uh, you know, performance and efficiency, right? As you need it, when you need it. Okay. 
And then, you know, you start to think about how some of these models as you deploy it can be um, constructed, right? You could now have a runtime with a notion of a small and medium and a large model, but they don't need to run all at the same time, but you only turn it on when the scenario requires it to, right? You can organize it more like a pipeline in terms of one triggering another but in the, in the gesture things where you have small parts of the model that are only running. And then when you need it, turn on more and more until you get you know, the best prediction that you want. We've shown that with the kind of gesture thing. It allows you to then turn things on and off, but it's a different organization in terms of what that model really is composed of, right? You may have other kind of trigger mechanisms. Right? We, we use the model itself in terms of, you know, what its confidence score might be, but you may have a lightweight object detector. It can be motion uh, centric to trigger any one of those models. Again, the ability to then throttle your model as needed uh, with, and, and process only when you need it, right? So I, I'm gonna end with this slide. I know I have some time. I'm, I'm, hoping for questions and things like that. And, and this slide would actually ask more questions than that it will answer, right? I'll start by saying, you know, I think dynamic networks like the trial network can be efficient, uh, can reduce latency and power consumption, right? Because you're starting to capture more system-oriented things into how the model is trained, how the model is composed. You start thinking about, hey, you know, if, if I'm deploying this model, how should it run and in different scenario? And if you're able to capture that system parameters into your original design, you have a better propensity to do uh, better in terms of uh, efficiency. Uh, I'm gonna suggest also hardware, software tools, people will start building kind of more capability towards the dynamic edge. Right? And then the last bullet here, and, and I just put there as a bullet, but there's so many things I could say under there is, what does it mean for other uh, domains? Let's say security and, and things, right? And we started to explore a lot of that. I don't have all the, the cyber and security kind of background. I'm hoping to collaborate here. But you start thinking about, hey, if the model itself is behaving in a way that is dynamic, that makes it harder for any attack in terms of how it behaves and how you can observe it. You can change the way it's adapting, right? So it opens a whole new idea about, hey, this is a model, the model performance operating points and how it actually produces result changes over time. It's hard to observe, therefore, you know, the attack surface is a little different from that perspective. Uh, so that, that bullet itself has a lot more things and we can definitely talk and, and I'm hoping to, to see more in this area and hopefully collaborate in, in that area as well. Okay. Um, I think that's, that's all I have. Hopefully that inspires you uh, and, and kind of think about how we could actually do more with what we have and not to be satisfied with just you know, what's given to us in terms of how we train models and, and how we push uh, the systems out, right? Thank, Thank you, Sec. That was a great talk, giving us some really practical insights into deploying the models and what are some considerations to think about when we're evaluating them in real world situations. I think there are a couple of questions already in the chat from Fatima. Do you want to ask them? Yeah, sure. Uh, thank you so much for this such an int intriguing talk, Dr. Jai. Uh, so I had a question about like um, how the network decides as to which parts of the network it has to activate. I think you mentioned the confidence. It somehow evaluates the confidence of the inference results. So I was wondering if you could please elaborate on that a little bit. Right, right. So we thought hard about what what makes it what what is the input to that uh, to that control network. How do you decide? Um, you know, whether to go throttle up or down and how do you kind of control that, that behavior, right? Um, mm -hmm. There's different kind of uh, school of thought in that one. One is if you are, if you know all the different states that you want, you could just codify it. So a very simple example that we, we talked about is if you build a model, and we're just making this up, if you build a model that operates differently in daytime and nighttime, right? There's nothing data-driven about it that you need to think about. It's, Time driven. So you look at time clock and say, you know, I should mm -hmm. be running this way, that way. That, you know, don't need to data driven that. If, it, if it's more complex where you say, I'm not sure what parts needs to be on or off, then you can make a data driven solution as, we, as we've shown it. And in this case, we use um, uh, the, the confidence score as a way 
to drive uh, you know, the different behavior. That could be one. You could have other inputs into that, that controller network because we have trained the controller and the, uh, the data network separately. You can afford the controller network to be trained with different inputs that has nothing to do with the, the input data itself. So the input data in the gesture recognition is video, right? Mm -hmm. If you train your control network with, let's say, power, you know, how much battery power you have, that's an input in there. You have a different reward mechanism with that RL system. So now you can say, I'm going to run my deep network based on uh, power management. It has nothing to do with input, but you are saying, I'm trying to gain the system to get me the best power performance, and I'm going to train it with that set of input. You can train different behaviors, right? Based on the different yeah. conditions that you have. Does that make sense? That's the reason yeah. why we separate the, the training to begin with, because there, there may be reasons where you want to have that dynamic behavior uh, operate in a way that is independent of that input data. Does that make sense? Yeah, and that means that opens up the scope of the controller that it can actually look at the performance metrics alongside the input, yes. not only just input, because based on input, it kind of becomes harder as well, I think, because during right. inference, it doesn't know which class it already is so that right. it will activate the parts of the network. Thank right. you so much. If I may yes. add um, a follow up question. So, do you think like uh, when you have this controller, you have some sort of overhead, right? On base, uh, on the base model. So when we're talking about optimizing the latency, uh, along with the power consumption, how do we account for that trade off? Like with this additional overhead and the overarching goal of optimizing the cost, how do we account for the cost of that overhead? That's an interesting kind of question. I, I don't have all the answers as well. I think a lot of it depends on how you constructed the model, how mm -hmm. you, you uh, want to partition it. You know, Darisha asked about, you know, if there's priority classes that you want to deal with, you can build ensembles. So the overhead comes a little bit on, you know, how you want to construct it in the beginning, with, right? Uh, mm -hmm. Generally speaking, right? I think there is a, a trade off because you're now adding a new dimension into, into this type of modeling. Um, you know, we showed one where, you know, not the best accuracy all the time. Yeah. There may be other kind of things that you have to trade off. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Welcome. We have uh, Panos next. Yes. Hello, Sek. Thank you very much for this presentation. Uh, this was very interesting work. Um, I had a question with respect to the controller. Mm -hmm. um, so when it comes to training a neural network, one approach is to consider given connections and then train the parameters. Another approach could be consider a many connections and uh, pre-trained parameters and then train which connections to remove, essentially, mm -hmm. implementing mm -hmm. something, you know. So now my question is, does, this, does the controller essentially do something like that? Essentially learning which, para which connections to remove? Um, yeah, in, in a way, when, when we... What what we so maybe maybe I'll start with the 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 underlying premise of why we train it or construct it the way we have. There's many different ways. I show different papers on a different approach. One of the things we we didn't want was the controller having too many outputs to feed in the network. So if you have a, a network with many control switches and everywhere, then all you're saying is you just have a very massive kind of connections between controller and network. So we say, let's reduce it to just one metric, which is utilization, meaning you just turn it on and off. And then from that point, yes, you are turning things on and off. It's almost like game, right? You, if you have eight different things you need to turn on, which one do you need to turn on to get the best result? That's all we're asking the controller to do. And then it decides it will do the exploration and turn this on, this on, this on, off, over the set of things. So in, in fact, yes, you just say we turn it on, or you can say, what am I turning off to get the best result? Got it. Uh, just uh, one small, uh, one brief follow up question. Um, so the network, the train network that you want to throttle with a controller, um, you know, the controller chooses which regions, let's say, to turn switch on and off. Um, are these regions pre clustered in a meaningful way? Or what kind of granularity? Do you give to the controller because I'm I'm assuming that that would affect somehow the latency in its operation. 
Yeah, that's that's another thing we kind of hidden in there, right? And you asked the right question, right? How how fine grained do you want some of these things, and where is the sweet spot in terms of how you may want to cluster it? So our initial intuition is that uh, we don't want to be uh, column wise or width wise kind of structure, right? You saw some of the thing where you have the summable network, and all it's doing is I'm just going to change the 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 width of the network, so the number of uh, features per layer as you go. And we find this a little bit restrictive in terms of uh, just having that concept.